I'm speaking now with activist and journalist with Freedom Socialist based in Washington State and the role of BDS in the US. BDS being boycott, divestment and sanctions launched in the early 2000s in Palestine. Now an international movement which, as its charter states, upholds the simple principle that Palestinians are entitled to the same rights as the rest of humanity. The backlash against BDS in a number of countries is well known and fought against, but today I'm interested to find out what it is able to achieve in the US, the country whose government defends Israel no matter what, and that journalist is Adrian Weller. Adrian, can we begin with your journey to support BDS and oppose the Zionist ideology which underpins the state of Israel, just as the US in effect bankrolls Israel and has done so for many decades. What's your family background? I grew up in the Bronx to a Jewish family. We weren't religious. My parents never talked about Israel, even though it was it was founded seven years after I was born. You know, so it was founded within my lifetime, Israel was. They never met, said anything about it, but we, I did grow up learning about the Holocaust. So I grew up not knowing or thinking much about Israel because we, we were secular. You know, my parents were not religious. But because I knew so much about the discrimination that had happened, I decided, I mean, I identified as Jewish, very much so because my family, but also what I knew about the history. I only learned really about Israel once I got involved with the Freedom Socialist Party. I mean, really, uh, that was in my 30s. And up until then, it had been something I just didn't think about. And that's when I learned about what it is and how it oppresses Palestinians. That started me on my journal for advocating for Palestinian rights. You say it wasn't until your 30s. Was that, would that be the same with most people? where you lived, that people weren't aware of what much about Israel and how Israel came into being? I can't really say because, see, I, I lived in the Bronx and I lived in Brooklyn and I lived in Manhattan. I mean, but then I went over to England for a while. I was in London for three years between, you know, late 20s, early 30s. And then when my husband and I split up, I went back to the States, but I went to the West Coast. I mean, it wasn't like I'd been at one place all my life and talking to people about, you know, what they thought about Israel, because, as I said, I didn't know anything about Israel when I was younger and or even when I was a young adult. Maybe it's because I was secular and not did not grow up in a Jewish, you know, kind of religious community that I didn't hear much about or anything about Israel. So that might be the reason. I think that being involved in a socialist party, a socialist feminist party, brought me aware of many, many things, you know, that otherwise I didn't know about because mainstream culture doesn't really tell you these things. However, nowadays, I think a lot more people are more aware about Israel because of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which has made it an issue internationally and nationally. It has been something that has become not internationally and especially nationally, Israel as an issue and Zionism as an issue has become a very dangerous and reactionary state and ideology that is threatening, you know, people's rights and, and you know, their rights to exist, not only the Palestinians in Israel and in Palestine, but it's an, they attack free speech rights because they try to tell people you cannot support BDS. Well, there's actually a case now that's headed for the Supreme Court where an Arkansas newspaper editor refused to sign a pledge that he would not boycott Israel, didn't see why he should. He was upheld in that. But then just recently, a court in Arkansas, a lower court, said that no, he didn't have a right to do to not to pledge because it wasn't a free speech issue. It was simply an economic issue. So that's probably headed to the Supreme Court now. The discussion is kind of leading me into this because up till now, there hasn't been any federal laws that have uh, approved uh, people saying, oh, you, 
you you cannot boycott Israel. You cannot support BDS. This would be, if this gets upheld, it would be the first time there's been a federal law that said that that it's okay to tell people you must pledge not to boycott Israel if you want to have a government contract or a state contract. So it's a it's a very uh, serious and dangerous ideology and uh, and state. I mean, a government. Can I take you back to the West Coast? I assume you're talking about the northern part of the western, the West Coast in the Seattle area. Would you say that was a very liberal, a very liberal part of America, or a very lefty part of America, and that's that helped you to understand just the fact that the, the, the cities or the towns which you were living in? I actually spent most of my West Coast time in Portland up until 2003 and then in Seattle from 2003 until current. So, yeah, mostly I've been in Portland and Seattle in the upper part, the northern part of the uh, west coast of the United States. Certainly there's been more of a activism around these issues. However, I literally did not encounter them until I became involved with the party and then and radical women. I have a woman who cuts my hair. And recently I asked her, do you know who em- Emmett Till is? She'd never heard of him. Now, Emmett Till is somebody that every activist, who, an Eftwin activist, he was a black boy who was murdered by the KKK years and years ago. He's, he's an infamous, you know, symbol of racism in the United States. This woman, who is intelligent, she owns her own business, she'd never heard of him. So my point is, is that it's hard to know what you would know just living in an, an area, a city, if you're not attached to a movement. Because it may seem to me that the people around me know about it, but maybe I wouldn't even have asked them if I didn't know about it. Well, people are kept ignorant for many reasons in many countries, aren't they? Yes, that's true. I think, though, there is more of a general knowledge of it, though. As you said, this is more of a left-wing, more liberal you know, state, as is Oregon, although, of course, you look under the surface and there's many, many, many problems. But yes, in general, we are not, you know, the deep south. We are not Texas. So there is that. That's true. And also because people have, and myself included, have, we've protested downtown. We have uh, did, you know, things uh, publicly about Palestine and about BDS. So people on the street are more informed because they, they walk by and they get a leaflet or a they talk to us or they see a banner, but also the whole way that Israel has been supported and pumped up by the United States government also makes them aware. I think it'd be hard not to be aware of Israel now because of the way the United States government supports them, because of the way Trump supported them, supports them. There's a general higher level of knowledge than when I was growing up. I was born in 41. In the 60s, I was in my 20s. So it's a, it was a different time. Talk about BDS and when those three letters came into your into your knowledge. What does BDS actually mean for you? Of course, it's a, it stands for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Started not that many years ago by a grassroots movement in in Palestine who were calling for civil disobedience based on the South African boycott against apartheid because they say that what's happening in Israel is apartheid, you know, a separation but on the basis of race. What it means to me is an international movement designed to call attention and action against the state of Israel and against Zionism because of their crimes against the Palestinians, because of the way the Israel state has killed them, stolen their land, beaten them up, humiliated them, garrisoned them into uh, sections of land, like with a very big wall, a wall that divides their, the area of Palestinians from is- Israel, and also in the Gaza Strip, which is a little tiny land, piece of land, which um, Israel has made into an open-air prison. Their water is poisoned by the Israelis there, 
bombed, they're shot at. I mean, there's no way to express what goes on there. There's no way to exaggerate it because it's really that horrible. And the United States stands behind all of it. The United States government and, and Europe also, but the U.S. is the prime backer of Israel and of its Zionism. Let's talk about BDS and how it has operated and how it's operating in the United States at the moment. Which areas have been targeted? Boycott action is national. It just depends on there are branches in many cities, I'm sure in in a lot of the cities, and they are, there was a a big campaign against SodaStream, which Star was backing. There was a you know, a national campaign against it. There's been a fight from professors and universities in order to target the way they've been restricted. Uh, Like, for example, uh, last year, Abby Martin, who was a journalist, who was going to speak at a Georgia Southern University, she was sent a contract that said that she had to have a loyalty oath to Israel. She refused to sign it. And then uh, two organizations backing Palestinian rights sued. The courts rejected the uh, state's attempt to have that suit rejected, and they upheld her right because they said, my First Amendment rights, you know, were involved in this. And that was obviously, you know, really important. In San Francisco in 2021, the United Educators of San Francisco became the first American K-12 public school union to endorse the BDS movement. They said that as educators in the USA, we have a special responsibility to be in solidarity with the Palestinian people because of the $3.8 billion annually that the U.S. government gives to Israel. They're using our tax dollars to fund apartheid and war crimes. And Cambridge, Massachusetts, Activists have been trying to get the city to cut its contracts with Hewlett Packard over the company's connection to Israeli apartheid. More than 100 people gave testimony at a city council meeting, a group of city council members uh, who were they nervous introduced a substitute amendment with a much vaguer language that it passed. But it doesn't contain strong B- B- BDS uh, language, but it calls investigation of the city into what the city invests in in terms of human rights violations. Then there's also pension funds have dumped Israeli firms. Cultural figures have refused to cross picket lines. Patty Smith and um, a number of other, you know, Rage Against the Machine, Roger Waters of Pink Floyd, they have signed letters demanding self-determination for Palestinians and calling for artists to refuse to perform at Israel and Israel sites. It's national and it's, you know, it's varied. There was also, well, there's actually also a lot in other countries, the UK, et cetera. Um, also recently, the Ben and Jerry, who are really big ice cream manufacturers, producers here in these states, said that they would not let their ice cream be sold in Israel anymore because of its, its apartheid. Now, Ben and Jerry, they're both Jewish. Now, this created, you know, obviously quite a stir. The uh, Zionists were denouncing the ice cream. Uh, what happened was Ben & Jerry is owned by Unilever. Unilever sold their rights to it to an Israeli firm, so it will be now produced in Israel. But Ben & Jerry said, we don't agree with this. This is wrong, and we're not going to profit at all from it. None of this money goes to us. Technically, they overturned it with money, but in, in fact, Ben & Jerry never backed down. I mean, there's been so much, you know. And also, um, this is about New Zealand. New Zealand, their fund, their $33 billion national pension fund, it has excluded five Israeli banks from its portfolio because of their role in financing Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Have the unions, the labor unions, been involved as well? Yes, they have been. In March of this year, both the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, which is the AFL-CIO, and the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, which is ACTS, 
AFSCME, which by the way, I am a retired member of AFSCME. Uh, they collectively representing more than 300,000 workers in the state, passed a resolution calling for the state of Oregon to divest from the fund that owns the Israeli spyware firm NSO. And then the Oregon Education Association, representing more than 40,000 teachers, passed a similar resolution at its convention. They are following this, the NSO group, was blacklisted by the Biden administration's Commerce Department, which is very rare for the government to actually take action on any of this. And then in 2021, teachers' unions in San Francisco, Seattle, and Portland passed resolutions in support of the BDS campaign for the first time in the United States. I, I used two main sources for getting general information. One is Mondo Weiss and the other is the Electronic Intifada. I find useful sources of, of news. Do you know of any artists who had planned to go to perform in Israel and were persuaded not to go? Oh, yeah, there's been so many. You know, the problem is, is I can't, there's so much information I can't remember. All day. There's been a lot of uh, artists who've been pressured not to go and have pulled back because of it. It happens frequently, very frequently. It is something that is, it happens constantly, where somebody is going to perform in Israel, and then they get pressure from the movement, the BDS movement, and they, they, they feed it. They, they don't go. It's not rare. It's, it's quite uh, common for artists to, you know, refuse to go to Israel in order to be able to uphold the BDS. You mentioned just before about the court cases. Is there a widespread backlash against BDS in the United States? I think the back yes, the backlash isn't from the people. The backlash is from the government. There is a, a lot of backlash uh, against BDS. Rage Against the Machine, Patty Smith, various other groups were initial signatures for the Musicians for Palestine Initiative. And it Algerian athlete refused to compete against Israel in the Tokyo Olympic Games in July and braved administrative punishment by the International Olympic Committee uh, because he, he is with the goal, eliminated the possibility of facing off against Israel. Best-selling author, Irish author Sally Rooney, respected the boycott and refused to allow an Israeli company to buy the Hebrew translations and publications. There is uh, the Palestinian campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel uh, hailed her for joining countless international authors in supporting the institutional cultural boycott of Israelis' complicit publishing sector. There's a lot of uh, cultural backlash, cultural refusal to deal with Israel because of its crimes. In terms of anti-BDS legislation, yes, it's, it's, there's a lot. Israel's uh, attempt to demonize it has resulted in pushing for censoring Palestinian voices and theirs of allies who want to make speaking out against Israel a crime. There was a um, lot of, well, recently this year, I did tell, did I just mention it, that an, an Arkansas news publisher was told he had to sign a pledge not to boycott Israel in order to have, a, a, you know, an ad placed in this paper. And he said, you know, he, he sued and he was upheld. But then a uh, lower court recently reversed that and said, no, you can't do it because it's just commerce. And this is headed to the Supreme Court. I think I just did tell you that. So there is a lot of backlash plus pushing back against the backlash. 30 U.S. states have enacted some form of anti-BDS legislation. Governments and universities and other international organizations have moved to suppress this movement. There's quite a battle going on, actually. It, I would call it a class, I would call it class struggle, even though it's obvious, you know, it's not that overtly. On the one hand, there are the people working for the rights of oppressed people, of ordinary working people, of teachers and students and private, uh, business owners in order to be able to just exercise their rights to engage in discussion, to bring up issues, and to 
you know, operate their business without being discriminated against by the government. And then there is the uh, right-wing nationalist racist movement in the United States backing the Israeli Zionists who want to make discussion of Israel, criticism of Israel, and of Zionism a crime. Do you think that in the United States there's less and less support for Israel, particularly with the young people? I do think so. I absolutely do think so. There has been um, concern among the right wing or among the, uh, you know, even uh, the Zionists that young Jews are walking away from Judaism because they all they ever hear, the only content of Judaism is you have to be in favor of Israel. Uh, there's anti-Semitism. You must be in favor of Israel. There's a, a, a man named Eric Alterman, who's an important liberal Zionist intellectual. He's not a left-winger. He's, uh, he's for Zionism. He spoke at uh, Tel Aviv University at the end of May, and he said that Israel has lost the American left, and Judaism itself is in crisis because all they have to say is you've got to be for Israel. And he's really angry at it, and he's cut Israeli peace organizations out of his will because Israeli society is going the wrong way. This man is going to be giving money to organizations that teaching about, about Judaism and not about Israel because he said uh, Judaism has no answers for young people. And uh, he said this, this is not true for the Orthodox, but secular American Judaism is dying on the vine. And this is the guy who's on their side. Also, there is the American Jewish Committee, which is also another big pro-Israel, pro-Zionist group here, is now condemning young Jews because they're turning against Zionism. And they, they are, you know, they're bewailing at what's happening, what's going wrong. And the point is, you cannot sell apartheid to these ideal, idealist young Jewish people. But they will not admit that. They think there's just something happening in their homes and, oh, if we can only do this or that. They will not deal the fact that Israel has become and is becoming a pariah nation. And actually, to go a little further, 24 senators, mostly Democrats, are calling on the FBI to investigate the murder of Shireen Abu Akla, the American Palestinian uh, journalist that was just murdered by Israel. Now, this is significant only because the Democratic Party is really not much of a savior for Palestinians or for, you know, free speech rights. And the fact that they feel that they can do this is a sign of the time. Internationally, everybody knows Israel targeted and murdered her, Shireen Abu Akla. And she was a very important, very highly respected uh, journalist. Also, the Harvard Crimson, do you know, I don't know if you know who they are. It's a daily student newspaper of Harvard University. It's very venerable. It was founded in 1873. They have endorsed BDS. And when they were criticized by Harvard faculty, they fought back and got over 100 signatures backing their endorsement of BDS. There's definitely something happening, absolutely. Finally, Adrian, I would say that BDS is alive and well in the United States and greatly supporting the people of Palestine. I would say that's true. I mean, we're not, I mean, I'm not saying that we're like a, a household name, but it's definitely, if nothing else, I think the attacks on BDS have made us more, not more visible because um, if you're going to attack somebody, you bring them into the limelight if, if they fight back. Also, there was um, another big Jewish Zionist organization is the Anti-Defamation League. And they are important because they put themselves forward as a civil rights organization. And they are consistently anti-BDS and attacking people who support BDS, which means, of course, attacking a lot of black liberationists and uh, people who are human rights, you know, and human and justice organizers. And so they have been targeted by people who are in support of Palestinian rights and in freedom of speech. On June 25th, this year, a petition was circulated uh, speaking out against the ADL attack on movements for Palestinian liberation. And both the Freedom Socialist Party and Radical Women have signed that 
petition. I could email you that link if you wanted me to. Okay. Final words? Do you have any uh, more? I know I've jumped around a lot, but you've asked me a lot of different <laughs> questions. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I guess my point is is that our freedom of speech is being attacked, and we are fighting back. But it's a, it's a serious battle, and if the right wing, who have a returned abortion rights here in the United States, can get this passed, the one or two things about the Melbourne sections of the Freedom Socialist Party and Radical Women, because they are very active uh, in solidarity action for Palestinian rights. Every year there's a protest for them, for Palestinians, and both RW and FSP get involved in them, also heavily involved in Aboriginal rights, who they connect to the rights of Palestinians, and also in the movement for reproductive rights and LBGTQ rights. So they're really quite active. And now FSP, the FSP Melbourne branch, is starting a study group on proletarian internationalism, uh, learning from socialist responses to the war yesterday and today on Zoom. If you want to find out what's happening in Melbourne, uh, Radical Women and the Freedom Socialist Party, go to socialism.com for FSP or to radicalwomen.org for Radical Women and look for their Melbourne branches, and that will give you the links to their activities. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. And Adrian, well, is a journalist with Freedom Socialist on the west coast of the United States.